So the thing on the bench today is the Asus ROG Zenith Extreme. It is the flagship Threadripper motherboard uh, from AMD. If you're looking to pony up the cash for a Threadripper CPU, uh, don't you want to give that CPU the most luxurian ride that you possibly can? Wouldn't you think, especially if you were a fan of Asus, that the ROG Zenith Extreme is just such a motherboard? So I was shocked to look on Newegg and Amazon, and you know, a lot of people have bought this motherboard for their Threadripper CPU, but it's one of the lowest rated X399 motherboards that's out there. But Threadripper's been out for a while. It's a new platform. It has some teething issues. <laughs> we all remember the teething issues from the X99 platform, I hope. That was a mess. Threadripper, honestly, was not bad. Not, not a terrible launch. It's been launched for a while. I think most of the issues have been resolved. But that's what the mission of today's video is, is to take a deeper look at the ROG Zenith Extreme a few months after Threadripper's release and see if those issues really have been resolved. Now, one thing that I've noticed right off the bat is that our socket, we've got a Foxconn socket on this motherboard, and this is a retail motherboard order from Amazon. This is not a sample or pre-production or anything like that. But if you check the photo on the back of the box, it shows a Lotz socket instead of a Foxconn socket. So I wonder if they switched sockets or were having trouble because I think the Foxconn socket is the one that is a little bit more problematic online. I noticed some of the complaints have been around Threadripper CPU installation, so. Now in terms of board layout, this actually looks pretty good. We've got our eight DDR4 DIMM slots. Looks like we've got some metal reinforcement in our DIMM slots as well, at least for the, uh, the divider. That is, uh, you know, quad channel memory, of course, on Threadripper. The name of the game is quad channel memory. We also have eight PCI Express by 16 slots. The, the lane configuration is by 16 by eight by 16 by eight. The one that's by eight at the bottom can share four of its lanes with the U.2 connector. So if you're gonna use the U.2 connector, the bottom lane, the bottom slot will become PCI Express by four. I'll also report that in our testing, when we used a GPU in the bottom slot, it was a little problematic to use the connectors along the bottom edge of the motherboard. Only the auxiliary power input, which is you know your standard Molex four pin power input, uh, which is auxiliary power if you're gonna run a lot of high current devices like GPUs, uh, was the only device that could really fit there. I mean, there's not really enough clearance here to use the fan connectors or the USB 3 connectors uh, if you're using a graphics card in the bottom slot. I think it's pretty rare, though, that people are going to be using, you know, double wide, two slot, two and a half slot graphics cards, uh, you know, and have to use the bottom slot with what they're doing. So can't really fault Asus too much for that. In addition to those PCI Express slots, we've got a PCI Express by four slot and a PCI Express by one slot. Those two slots go through the chipset, so that's a PCI Express 2.0 type interface. Now let's do a quick tour of our connectors on this motherboard. At the top edge of the motherboard, we can see that we've got a WB sensor input. This is a proprietary connector, but it will let you use uh, you know, a water block sensor, or other input type sensor devices with this particular motherboard. You'll have to consult the manual for, for usage on that. Then we've got our 5050 RGB header connector and two four pin fan headers. These are for the CPU. Then we've got two eight pin power inputs, which is way over here, way on the other side of the memory slots. That's probably okay. Then we've got our, our power button and our reset button, our 24 pin ATX power connector, a dip switch, which I'll come back to in a minute, another four pin fan header, an analog temperature input, a front panel USB type C input, then we've got three pair of six gigabit per second SATA ports, the U.2 connector I was mentioning before, our front panel connections. Then we've got more fan headers, including a water pump header, uh, some more analog inputs, some switches for controlling some stuff. I'll come back to those in a minute. Uh, another USB 3.0, that's USB 3.1 Gen 1, the protocol front panel header, some USB 2 headers, another four pin fan header, two more, of course, RGB uh, headers, of course, ARA compatible. Then we've got our TPM header, our four pin Molex power input for GPU auxiliary power. Then of course, our HD audio front panel connector as well. Also featured on this motherboard is the DIMM.2 slot. So DIMM.2, there's, there's actually a lot of stuff on this motherboard that is pretty rare or ASUS unique. And DIMM.2 is one of those ASUS unique things. DIMM.2 is a connection mechanism for two of your M.2 devices on this motherboard. You can basically install the M.2 uh, devices on this daughter card, basically, that's gonna vertically raise that off the motherboard. It's gonna be better airflow. Those M.2s are gonna be cooler. And the interface goes through a memory looking slot, but it's actually a uh, PCI Express interface. 
I like this. I like this approach really well. There is another M.2 underneath the chipset, which has a mixed, uh, you know, plastic and metallic finish. It looks, you know, it's, it's the Asus ROG aesthetic. If that's what you're going for, then, you know, there it is. The power delivery system on this motherboard is substantial. We've got a heat pipe going around uh, behind our I.O. shield, and there is a full mechanical fan to help cool the VRMs if there's no airflow in your case. Although there should be airflow in your case, you should install a top fan or something like that, especially if you've got a water pump, just so that there's some airflow over your motherboard because that's basically the expectation with designs these days. At the rear panel, we can see that the I.O. shield is pre-installed. You will not have to worry about installing an I.O. shield in your case. We've got our wireless solution, which is Bluetooth 802.11ac, a 2x2 configuration, and a 1x1 802.11ad. I believe this is the only Threadripper motherboard that has this type of high-end wireless solution. Then we've got eight USB 3.1 Gen 1, the protocol, um, USB connectors. We've got two USB 3.1 Gen 2 connectors, one type A and one type C. Then we've got our Intel Gigabit NIC. Now the audio codec on this motherboard, while it is based on the Realtek ALC 1220 codec, it has really high-end ES9018 digital to analog converters. So you'll get a, a much cleaner sound from those particular digital to analog converters, or so they tell me. Premium motherboard, premium price, premium accessories, right? Well, yeah, the, the ROG Zenith Extreme does not disappoint there. In the box, you get an Aquantia 10 gigabit ethernet card. This is the ROG um, Arion, I think is how you pronounce that. You get six SATA, six gigabit per second SATA ports, SLI bridges for high-speed bridge, two-way and three-way. You've got uh, your, your DIMM.2 module. Instead of a driver CD, it's a driver USB stick. That is that is long overdue, something that's long. Of course, the CD is cheaper than a USB stick, but hey, this motherboard's kind of expensive. You've got all manner of stickers and accessories. You've also got uh, wireless antennas for both your 2x2 wireless solution and your 802.11ad solution. There's also a GPU retention bracket. Another feature of this motherboard is that it has an OLED diagnostic readout screen. Yes, instead of diagnostic code readouts or, you know, divining the magic LEDs or the magic smoke from the, from the LEDs, it's got an OLED screen. So you can actually just read the error directly from the OLED screen and be all set. Putting these systems through their paces is always a lot of work. Always the disassembly, the reassembly, you know, all that stuff. So what's the verdict? You know, is there something to those reviews? Well, I think it's just expectations. If you pay a premium for a motherboard, you're going to expect a premium experience. And I think Asus really has delivered on that, at least for my experiences with this motherboard. The software bundle, I mean, it comes with the uh, turbo processing unit and you get the five-way optimization and the software suite that we've covered in the past. Asus has done a pretty good job providing that bundle, even on the relatively you know, new AMD platform, which, I mean, that's a lot, that's a big deal. Threadripper as a platform is kind of new. There are going to be teething issues. I definitely did not have a perfect experience. I had to update the UEFI, that goes without saying. The UEFI was a little older than I would have expected on the ASUS website. I also had trouble getting a 128 gigabyte G-Skill kit to work with this particular motherboard. Now I'm using a Samsung uh, G-Skill Trident Z B-Die memory kit with this right now, DDR4-3200. I was able to set that, it worked, and it worked great out of the box. The voltage profiles were also a little aggressive on this motherboard. So I guess, you know, for Threadripper, lowest common denominator, under heavy loads, you will see this motherboard feed your CPU 1.45, 1.5 volts even. Uh, with the updated UEFI, I did not see it hitting 1.5 volts as much, but because this is my CPU, I really did not want to damage it. So I just manually dialed in my own settings. In Linux testing, everything basically worked as advertised in Linux. Linux has pretty good support for Aquantia at this point, as long as you're running a newer kernel. Now, of course, me being me, I was running a bleeding edge 4.14 RC6, at least at the time of this video, Linux kernel, and basically everything is okay. The IOMMU groups on this motherboard are also a little weird, like all Threadripper IOMMU groups. You should know that if you use the bottom slot, the, the combination of the U.2 and the M.2, those will be grouped together in the same slot. So it seems almost like that there are maybe IOMMU groups of 16 lanes and some motherboard manufacturers break them out a little differently than others. So uh, the, the DIM.2 lanes in this configuration basically seem to be okay. The only real IOMMU group 
overlaps are in the peripherals that are connected through the chipset. So uh, that's group 12 in this case. Now there was an option in the UEFI, but I'm not sure that I've seen on other boards something about enabling IOMMU through one die or both dies. Uh, I did try the IOMMU groups in both configurations. There was a little bit of difference between the two, but really not a lot of difference in the, uh, in the grouping. With, with it enabled, uh, you did actually get a little bit better isolation, but everything connected through the chipset was still in its own group, so you know your mileage may vary. With that said, the last thing we've got to cover is the UEFI tour, but I, I know you're waiting. It's like, I just want a one sentence summary, just a one sentence unequivocal, you know, what do you think? Given that a 10 gigabit ethernet card by itself at the time of this video is north of $100, um, if you need 10 gigabit, then the value probably is there for you. Threadripper being a uh, new platform, you will pay the early adopter tax a little bit. Uh, it does seem like a lot of the launch issues have been taken care of, but there are still a few launch issues that remain unresolved. So if you need something up and running tomorrow, um, you know, maybe this platform, <laughs> I don't know. I, I can't wait to revisit this platform because it's like, yeah, this is going to be really great. It's just some of these little issues are there. Now, if you're just going to buy this machine and set up Windows on it, you're not going to run into any of these issues. This is mostly around Linux, open source, uh, hardware pass-through, hardware virtualization, maybe a little bit with your memory timings. Sometimes at a cold boot, I did have trouble hitting 3200. It would sometimes come up and say, hey, I couldn't get the memory to work at 3200. I just go in UEFI, save, reboot again, and it was fine. Finally did get the 128 gig kit working as well. I had to reseat the DIMMs about 50 times and just like rearranging the DIMMs and like unseating them and reseating them and unseating them and reseating them. Uh, finally seemed to fix it. So that's really bizarre. That was using all eight slots. So your mileage may vary. Overall, the verdict is it's a premium motherboard with a premium price tag. But uh, you know, if you're splashing out for Threadripper, uh, you probably want Threadripper to have a luxurian ride anyway. So if I got it wrong or I got it right, or you wanna share your own comments or experiences at the level one forum so everybody else knows what to expect, then please do come to the level one forum. So Wendell, I'm signing out and I'll see you there.